Hey everybody, um, it's Professor Harold. How you doing? Hey, uh, as I record this lecture, this is the Sunday after Thanksgiving, Sunday, November 25th. Thanks for uh, your patience with me. We did uh, this past week in my family. Um, we had a close family member. It's actually my my uh, wife's father passed away, and we had the um, funeral and the associated things with that this week so i appreciate your patience um with me not posting a lecture the previous week um at any rate i am posting this lecture just sort of as a a free floating uh end to the course to the 80 50 course because i think it's applicable and you're going to notice a couple things different about this lecture it has the uno uh, title at the top uh, that's because I've offered this lecture to uh, other groups and I'll get to that in a second before I get to that though just a couple of reminders of the do-ins for the course as we are starting to wrap up the course there is your unit 4 journal which is going to be due Saturday December 1st that's your final journal and then so there's no discussion during the, that week the week ending December 1st and then, so the last two weeks of class, uh, we're, we're going to do a couple things which are pre-planned. Uh, first is, you will do your extended abstract of your project. But let me move ahead so I can describe what that is. Your, your scholarly book review is due on December 12th, which is the Wednesday of finals week. So have that posted, attached as a file at the appropriate link on the final week of the course. Uh, the reason I, I make it due on Wednesday of finals week, uh, even though uh, graduation day is Friday, is because of the requirements for me to get grades posted uh, by early the next week. So I only have a certain number of days to get grades posted. That typically gives me uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to grade all the papers. and and then hopefully get all your final grades posted by the following Monday after graduation. Um, so that's your paper, and you know that from the syllabus, what the requirement for that is. The extended abstract, which is also in the syllabus, that's a discussion. Um, so I open that up on the discussion board. That'll be, I ask you to post that by December 5th, so take note of that. That's also a Wednesday, not the typical day I ask for discussions. Uh, on this one, what I want you to do is write a about a 300-word abstract um, describing the work that you wrote on. And this I find to be useful because uh, all of the students can then see the various works that you all wrote on and, and actually get a hint as to whether or not they'd like to read that book. I think it's a really useful exercise. For that one, I don't require you to comment back to each other, but I do encourage you to do that. Okay, so let me get to this lecture, which I think is a good wrap up for the course, for the 8050 course. It relates directly to 8050. So it, the reason the banner, the UNO banner is on this is because I've offered this at um, different um, speaking engagements. The last time I did this, I, I gave this to a group of uh, civilian employees of the Army, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and so you'll see some references to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in this talk. Um, but I, I call this talk leading as a bureaucrat because all of these people, uh, I whether they wanted to be known as bureaucrats or not, I, I start out the talk by informing them that, in fact, they are bureaucrats. And so how do they lead as bureaucrats? So... Um, I'm not going to have you do that for this class, but something I do when I give this talk is I ask people to come up to the whiteboard in the classroom and list some adjectives or descriptors um, that are associated with the, the word bureaucrat. I ask them to list some on the whiteboards. And then we talk about some of those descriptors. And, and these are some typical answers that, that we see. Um, we see that uh, bureaucrats are described as rule-bound people as officious or self-important, as inflexible, as obstructionist, as unelected, as faceless, 
as nameless and um, a term that uh, is not a new term but has uh, gained some popularity lately. They're described as deep state actors. So bureaucrats really, uh, to call someone a bureaucrat, of course, is not a compliment. And but as it turns out, uh, in 8050, this whole term, that's kind of what we've been talking about. What What is a bureaucrat and what is the role of a bureaucrat in our democracy? Um, so you can click on this link or you can just copy and paste this link. Uh, what this describes is Ronald Reagan's uh, first inaugural address. I'm going to try to link to it here in this lecture and see what happens. It didn't work. <laughs> so um, on the on the PowerPoint version of this, go ahead and click on that link. In that talk, what President Reagan says during his first inaugural address is, I'm going to paraphrase him, he says, uh, for those of you who think that government is the answer to our problems, well, basically you're wrong. Government is the problem. And that quote Government is not the answer to our problem. Government is our problem is a famous quote from Ronald Reagan's um, presidency and, and really from Ronald Reagan's philosophy of government, because President Reagan did spend some time during his two terms in office um, to some extent trying to dismantle the federal bureaucracy. And we began to see some efforts such as contracting out and privatizing some parts of the federal bureaucracy. However, um, President Reagan certainly is not alone in that view of the federal bureaucracy. Um, many elected leaders of both parties, I will say, have made uh, made great sport, I guess, of of criticizing the federal bureaucracy. So in 2018, Senator Sass from Nebraska uh, was talking about a bill. He said, this bill is too expensive. Spending on defense is good, but no, we do not need more across the board spending on every single government program every single bureaucrat ever imagined. So keep that in mind what he said there. Every single government program, every single bureaucrat ever imagined. Uh, there was a famous member of Congress named uh, Eugene McCar McCarthy from Minnesota um, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and he was quite anti-bureaucracy. He said, the only thing that saves us from bureaucracy is inefficiency. An efficient bureaucracy is the greatest threat to liberty. So that's kind of a double-edged uh, criticism that not only is bureaucracy inefficient, but it's kind of good that it is inefficient because if bureaucracy were efficient, it would systematically take away our liberties. Um, and then Senator Ted Cruz in 2015 said, it's time to return to a federal government that abides by our constitutional framework and strips power from unelected bureaucrats. So a couple, terms that Senator Cruz throws in there uh, are the Constitution and unelected bureaucrats. So there's another famous Democrat, as a matter of fact. So if you're if you're following along here, you notice I quote uh, two Republicans and two Democrats. There was a senator from Wisconsin named William Proxmire, who was famous for uh, for his really his railings against the bureaucracy. And he even designed an award, a, a sort of a fictitious humorous award he called the Golden Fleece Award that he awarded to various government agencies that had been wasting taxpayer money. And in this, he's talking about a scientist named Dr. Hutchinson uh, who studied uh, the behavior of primates. And he said, Dr. Hutchinson's studies should make the taxpayers as well as his monkeys grind their teeth. In fact, the good doctor has made a fortune from his monkeys and in the process made a monkey out of the American taxpayer. Uh, he says, it's time for the federal government to get out of this monkey business. In the view of the transparent worthlessness of Hutchinson's study of jaw grinding and biting by angry or hard drinking monkeys, it is time we put a stop to the bite Hutchinson and his bureaucrats who fund him have been taking from the taxpayer. So, so Dr. Hutchinson was actually um, intoxicating primates uh, to study their behavior, um, which Senator Proxmire says was a waste of the taxpayer's money. Um, so what are the themes of all these? Again, these two Republicans and two Democrats, uh, what are the themes of the things they have to say? Well, 
here's some things you can pick out just from those four quotes. And really, <laughs> you can find thousands more quotes. But one, bureaucrats are inefficient. Uh, two, bureaucrats waste money and, and really like wasting money, as Senator Proxmire was talking about with the scientist, Dr. Hutchinson. Um, three, bureaucrats like academic studies that reach obvious conclusions, as in, if you get a monkey drunk, it will act like a drunk monkey. Um, four, bureaucrats, not senators or members of Congress, are the people who dream up various government programs. And that goes back to Senator Sass's quote, where he talks about, you know, bureaucrats are the ones who dream up government programs and then go out looking for funding. Um, five, bureaucrats have a lot of power and are unaccountable in its use. And six, um, going back to the quote from Senator Cruz, and these are really important, bureaucrats are unelected and bureaucrats are not in the Constitution. So that really is the crux of what I want to talk about in this little talk. That bureaucrats are unelected and that bureaucrats are not in the Constitution, meaning that bureaucrats have no legitimacy. Well, as all of you know, from being in PA 8050 this entire semester, it was once cool to be a bureaucrat. So there we have a picture of our friend Max Weber, the German sociologist, who, as you all recall, uh, said that bureaucracy is rational and bureaucracy is efficient. And you recall from reading a little bit about Max Weber, that he compared bureaucracy to what he said were a couple other kinds of authority, traditional authority, which means uh, established by long accepted cultural and societal expectations and patterns, such as from the European context, in Weber's case, monarchies and principalities, where, uh, where princes and kings and other monarchs um, inherited, inherited authority and that was accepted as a tradition. Or charismatic authority, which Weber referred to. Um, that is, that persons with extraordinary personal abilities inspire obedience and devotion. And when I think of Max Weber, it's always interesting to me that just really a few decades after, after Weber wrote, um, Weber died in 1920, um, Germany was completely changed by a person with charismatic authority um, and uh, Europe was completely changed by uh, persons with charismatic authority. So when you think of not only Hitler, uh, but Mussolini in Italy and Franco in Spain, um, during this time, um, the, the rise of fascism and the rise of, of really sort of cult of personality based communism, as in the case of Stalin, was quite strong in Europe. Um, Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State, wrote a book called Fascism within the last year or two. Um, really good book um, in that she traces the rise of fascism in Europe. And, and it's really interesting that, um, that really these authoritarian, these really uh, really strong authoritarian and tyrannical regimes um, in Europe and also in, well, the Soviet Union and China, um, when you think of, of Maoist type communism, were really based on a charismatic authority. Um, but Weber, writing in the late 1800s, early 1900s, said that what we really need is a legal rational authority. And so bureaucracy is legitimized by legally established laws, rules, and regulations. And that is the part of bureaucracy that Weber said was necessary, that those rules don't exist uh, for themselves. They exist to establish legitimacy. So this is, you know this from, from uh, being in PA 8050, this, this term, right? So. Weber's bureaucracy, bureaucratic organization in a nutshell, was there was a division of labor, which meant that complex work was broken into simple tasks. There was a hierarchy of authority, which I already circled there, um, meaning there was a recognized chain of command. There was impersonality, meaning it doesn't mean you don't be friendly. It just means that 
effort, the effort of the organization is directed by the rules, not by personalities. And then finally, there's formal selection, meaning that those who fill leadership roles and other roles in the bureaucracy have qualifications that they must meet before they can work there. And so we know that um, this hierarchy of authority, this red triangle at the top, is the person in charge of the bureaucracy. And we know that Luther Gulick came along later, um, and he, he defined the role of the bureaucrat, the top bureaucrat, in this acronym POSDACORP, where he talked about planning, organizing, staffing, directing, coordinating, reporting, and budgeting. And so Luther Gulick said that the person at the top of any single bureaucracy had those specific roles to, to fulfill. And so we have this idea of the vertically integrated bureaucracy where the person at the top can direct the entire organization and, for example, have maybe seven people working for them that did each of these things. And so it's very organized, uh, very structured, right? But bureaucracy's gotten a bad name. So, you know, as a professor of public administration, I it's not my intent to really praise bureaucracy. We read this semester, you all read um, the ideas of new public administration, a movement in the late 60s, early 70s. You read about new public management, um, kind of a market-based approach in the 80s and 90s that's still with us. Uh, this week you're reading about um, New public service, uh, an idea that uh, the Denharts came up with really to challenge new public management. But the point is that um, we've never really had something like this pure bureaucracy. The, the public administration has been has been rife with critics of bureaucracy and how we should think about bureaucracy. And so go all the way back to the readings I had you do with Simon and Dahl. Um, with uh, Waldo. So the idea is that we we have continued to try to find ways to make the work that is done in the bureaucracy more effective. So I'm not here to say that bureaucracy is great and we should every organization should be, should be a vertically integrated bureaucracy. I'm not here actually to get rid of it either. What I am here to say is that we, in fact, have a constitutional reason to exist, and it's incumbent upon us to take that mantle and lead with it. Here's a book I didn't assign you to read, although I did have you read some stuff from John Rohr. Um, John Rohr was a professor of public administration at Virginia Tech for decades. Um, he passed away in about 2011. This is a, a book of his that I would highly recommend. It's called To Run a Constitution and the Legitimacy of the Administrative State. Um, what this talks about is just what the title says, the legitimacy of the administrative state. So this slide talks about the legitimacy of administrators and also the accountability that administrators owe because you recall I had you delve into the Bell, California case a little bit, um, and we talked about ethics. Um, so here's here's the uh, the thing about legitimacy. I believe that so-called bureaucrats have legitimacy under the Constitution, and that's the what John Rohr emphasizes in that particular book I I referred to. But bureaucrats also have accountability and so who how is the legitimacy derived and and to whom is the accountability owed and that's what this slide purports to tell you so step one is this the people are sovereign by natural law okay so read the first few lines of the declaration of independence those aren't just words that thomas jefferson decided to put down on paper what Jefferson was talking about when he said that people are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, he was really he was really borrowing from John Locke. And 
and what what Jefferson was saying is that there is something like natural law now whether you you say well hmm in the postmodern era I'm not sure that that Jefferson's version of natural law is any better than anybody else's version of a natural law okay that's fine but that's what Jefferson was referring to the idea that there is some natural law which makes people um, both free and sovereign now the fact of the matter is that the founding generation um, some of them strongly believed in slavery and and so were compromised by that some of them didn't strongly believe in slavery but com but compromised that position in order to form a constitution and so we it's problematic but there is the idea that the people are sovereign by natural law and so the people form a constitution so now go to the next document uh the constitution and it, that starts out in the preamble by saying we the people so what the point Rohr makes in the book is that the act of founding the nation under the Constitution, the nation wasn't necessarily founded by the Declaration, the nation was founded by the Constitution. Um, the act of founding under the Constitution uh, was a sovereign act. So the Constitution was ratified by all the existing states at the time, and that was a sovereign act. So that founding act provided legitimacy to the Constitution and then the Constitution itself legitimizes the formation of government through direct and indirect elections appointment with advice and consent and direct appointment okay so what's that statement say what what that statement says is that the so-called officers of the government so if we, we think of the officers of the government we're thinking about the president the vice president the members of the Senate the members of the House of Representatives the members of the Supreme Court and many others many others uh, including cabinet secretaries including judges in lower courts the point that Rohr makes in the book is that all of those officers are put into office not only by election through direct elections that is but by indirect elections so remember the original Constitution the only people in office at the national level who were put there by direct election were members of the House of Representatives the Senate was indirectly elected the president was indirectly elected Supreme Court justices and other lower court judges are appointed by the president and approved by the Senate through the advice and consent process Rohr tracks he researchers and tracks 22 separate ways that a person at the national government level can be put into office 22 separate ways not all of which are election so elected directly and indirect officials or officials legitimized by the constitutional process make laws and policy and establish rules for operation of departments and agencies as well as establishing frameworks for establishing administrative policy and rules okay what's that mean that means that the Congress essentially and the administration do in fact write laws and policy but they also establish rules for the operation of departments and agencies at the national government level and they make they set up by law the framework for how those agencies operate that means that administrators who are legitimized by this constitutional process carry out policy and they also make rules as authorized so I think we may have talked about the Administrative Procedures Act of 1946 if we didn't uh, um, look it up the Administrative Procedures Act of 1946 we have in our system of government we have laws we also have federal regulations and there has been a great deal of talk during the last two years about dismantling the the structure of federal regulations as if those federal regulations were put into place in the middle of the night by faceless nameless bureaucrats they weren't they were put into place under a process approved by Congress starting with the Administrative Procedures Act of 1946 and furthermore judges legitimized by a constitutional process periodically rule on the constitutionality of laws and policy so we know this right we know that this is what the Supreme Court does 
judges have also been criticized as entering into the legislative process, making laws as judges. Nevertheless, they have legitimacy to do that. And finally, administrators, you and me, are organized in some rational manner, and we use imposed rules as well as granted discretion to carry out law and policy on behalf of the government. So go to the left side of this chart, the legitimacy arrow goes down. The legitimacy arrow flows down from all the way back to the people who are sovereign by natural law, and particularly the Constitution. But go to the far right hand side of this slide, and there's the accountability arrow which goes up. So to whom are we accountable? We are accountable to the elected officials. We are accountable to the Constitution, ultimately. And it is not as if bureaucrats can escape their constitutional accountability. They can't. And so in general, this applies not only at the national level, but at the state level and the local level as well. Might have to change the terms a little bit. But in general, this is how we link legitimacy and accountability. And so I have some insights from that. Um, at the national level, the formation of departments, agencies, and independent regulatory agencies by Congress has constitutional legitimacy, unless the court says it doesn't. So the philosophy of employment for government uh, generally has transitioned, right, from our founding era, from agencies run by elites through a spoil system, famous, famously popularized by President Jackson, through a qualification for office system. Um, which is what Wilson was talking about. That the employees of these organizations are legitimate, not because they say so, but because of the Constitution. And that the employees of these organizations are accountable as well. That's my other arrow, right? So who are we accountable to? We're accountable to the people, to the Constitution, to the executive, to the legislative, and to the judicial. Well, that might cause some conflicts, right? Because the executive might say one thing and the Congress might say something else. But this is what we fight over in our constitutional system. So the agency mission theoretically is grounded in law and policy, not in whim, the whim of the bureaucrat or the whim of anyone else. Uh, employees are qualified professionals, not spoilsmen. That was the term that was used um, under the spoil system. And employees are removed from office for being unqualified, not for having other ideas that, uh, that are in conflict with the ideas of the executive or the ideas of someone in Congress. And so we see it at the national level and actually at the state level as well. Um, agencies do work for the executive most of the time, for the president or for the governor. But the legislative body, be that Congress or the state legislature, has oversight. And so we see that conflict and we often see that uh, an agency head is put in a squeeze somewhat between the ideas of someone in Congress and the ideas of someone in, in the executive. But in either case, um, in our system, removing someone for having different ideas is not really necessarily the way we remove people from office. Although some appointed people are removed for that very thing. And so the executive must issue legal orders, but Congress and the courts also have something to say about it. And so in our separation of power system, Congress and the court always have something to say about it, and they should have something to say about it. And so we see that the bureaucrat herself is often the person squeezed in the middle of all this. And that finally, the people individually and in groups have a voice, right? We know that. Um, uh, I say individually and in groups. So the group could be a lobbying organization. We, we like to criticize lobbying organizations, but they do provide a voice uh, and they do provide that point of view to uh, members of the executive and members of the legislative. And so I asked these 
uh, students this uh, when I spoke to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers a few months ago. To whom does the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers answer? So, see all those things on the left-hand side there? They answer to businesses, recreation, industry. Uh, they answer to internal audiences. They answer to the Congress, to uh, various tribes, to federal agencies, and on and on and on. The Corps of Engineers does, does water management projects, as you know, um, but they have lots of constituencies. And actually, I didn't make these up. These came from a letter by the person who in 2002 was the commander of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, a lieutenant general in the Army. So he said, here's all your constituencies. Now look at that list of constituencies, and you can easily see that recreation interests and business interests might be in conflict with each other. You can easily see that environmental interests and industry interests might be in conflict with each other, right? You can easily see that state and local officials and agencies might have different interests than agricultural interests. Yet the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers tries somehow to balance all these interests uh, in their mission. And so these questions come up. If you're trying to do your job in that agency or any other agency, five questions um, that I think are kind of rhetorical, but that sort of sum up our service in the public sector. Um, one, to whom do you owe your loyalty? Two, how do you lead within the context of multiple constituencies? Three, how do you lead your way out of constituent conflict? Four, to which branch of the government do you answer and where does that leave you with regard to the other branches? And five, how does the fact that our Republic is a Federalist arrangement affect your obligations? So what's a good bureaucrat to do, right? Um, a few suggestions, a few things to keep in mind, I think. One is civil servants are not instruments of the executive, the legislative, or, or the courts. We're not instruments, right? We don't just carry out orders mindlessly. Second, civil servants are not necessarily equals of the three branches. So anyone who says, um, well, there's a fourth branch of government and we don't want a fourth branch of government, that's not what I'm saying. I don't say that bureaucrats are the equals of the three branches, but the authority and responsibility and accountability we do have does uh, does not fully derive from each of these branches individually, but from all of them. The representatives of the people are not only the people elected to the House of Representatives or the Senate. In, in a very real sense, uh, those of us who work in government are representatives of the people. Um, finally, the, the source of your authority is the Constitution, not somebody's whim. You have been granted discretion as a public official, but that discretion doesn't mean you make arbitrary decisions. They have to have a grounding. You have to recognize you're accountable to the Constitution but to other constitutional entities as well, meaning those three branches. And you recognize there will be conflicts of expectations within these accountability relationships. Uh, and you recognize that administrative answers should be consistent no matter who's asking. I think that's a really important one. Um, you don't tell, if you're at the state level, you don't tell the governor one thing and tell the legislature another thing. Um, and finally, recognize that at some point, um, all this standing on principle that I'm talking about might be a tad unpopular with certain people, uh, and you will be called a faceless, nameless, unelected bureaucrat. So thank you for your attention this term. I'm looking forward to wrapping up these final three weeks and seeing what you have produced. Thanks.